Um, so as the title suggests, this is called the Pedagogy Sweater for your videos. Uh, let me prime everybody right now. This is going to be like some of me talking, and then the whole second half is going to be a big discussion between me and you all and your peers, all right? So uh, get through your emails now, finish up with Facebook, because <laughs> otherwise that second half is going to be really awkward and quiet when nobody knows what to talk about. Uh, for anybody who hasn't worked with me before, um, I used to work here for him and with the rest of these smart people. Uh, my name is David Lyons. Uh, I then jump shipped and I now work for Instructure. You may know the product we make. Um, some of you might have heard of it. Uh, and I will apologize. Uh, I think presentations that start, with, start out with an apology are always really terrible, but uh, this is my two-year-old. And uh, on Saturday, I started having to deal with this. Um, so I'm like super tired. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so I thought, actually, it's funny, right? Like, let's talk about video, and like, I don't have a video of my daughter. Um, this actually is a video. It's just newborns are really boring. Like, uh, they have two speeds, this and crying. So um, I caught a video of the, the sleeping one. Um, but I think that's really actually a good segue into um, does this thing I'm making really even need to be a video, right? So uh, there's an unlimited kind of content you can put into your course. There's you know text and images. Of course, there's video. There's simulations. There's games. There's quizzes and assignments. And right, the list just goes on and on forever. Um, video is easier to make now than it's ever been before. Uh, we all carry around super high-definition cameras everywhere we go. If you have a modern iPhone, they even do cool things like slow-mo, and you can get little tripods for them. Uh, there's a really good chance every single laptop I see in here has an HD camera built into it. Everybody has screen recording software built in. It's rudimentary, but it'll get the job done, right? So it's easier now to make this stuff than it's ever been before, but do you always need video, right? Sometimes it's not going to be that helpful, right? You're your rate of return is going to kind of peter out really early. Other times it could actually be detrimental. Um, some stuff just doesn't really lend itself well to video. So uh, that's something I kind of assume for everything we're going to talk about that you have asked yourself that question and decided, yes, I do want to make a video, right? Um, and then when we say video, what, what do I really mean when I say video? So, so let, let's get some audience participation. When I say video, what do you guys think that means in the context of your course? Something moving. That's good. It's incredibly broad. <laughs> a visual recording. A visual recording. Good. Anybody else? Sound. Sound. Sound? It's got sound. Okay. Video have to have sound? Animated GIFs, do those count as video? No. Okay. Um, so to me, this is kind of a spectrum. So you have like a, a 30 second talking head, right? Like a little news blurb, like, you know, today at 11. You know, half the teams won their games in all the sport ball competitions. And then uh, you could have like a desktop recording, right? So here's me showing you how the software works and I've recorded my desktop. Uh, then you could have something like lecture capture, right? Uh, Noah talked about Panopto, so that would kind of count as video. And then you have something like a full length feature film, right? Like a movie, right? And these all kind of fall under the broad umbrella of video. So if you use video in your course, it could be any of those things. But I really want to talk about the last two for a second. Um, Anybody not see this yet? Okay, so you're all dismissed. Um, I don't know, where's the downtown people? Where's the closest theater? Right over there? Okay, so go expense it to your department. Um, uh, yeah, so when I say video in the, the context we're talking about here, I really don't mean films. Um, some of you might teach in a context where a film is appropriate, and there's nothing wrong with films. It's just that uh, you have not a lot of control over these, right? If a, you're giving an assignment to a student where they need to watch a film, it's probably not really appropriate for you to break that up into chunks and to do weird things with it and mess with it. Like you're, you're assigning them this product as it exists. Um, so I really don't mean films. And I kind of don't mean lecture capture. Um, and the reason is there's nothing wrong with lecture capture, so I'm not trying to decry anybody who uses lecture capture. Um, and it can benefit from some of the things we're going to talk about. But the reason I say lecture capture kind of doesn't count is because you are really just providing this reproduction of a live event. And then anything you build on top of that is going to work with the things we're going to talk about. But there's a limit to how you can chop up and rework lecture capture before it stops being lecture capture. And then it's just a video that happens to include these live recordings. So feature films. Um, Lecture capture, not totally inside the scope. Um, 
So with disclaimers and definitions and explanations out of the way, um, what I want to talk about for the first half of this is some kind of bare bones things that I feel like you have to do to make your videos really good and usable in your course. And the first thing I want to talk about is duration. So how long, somebody volunteer, how long should your videos be? Wrong, shorter than that. How long should videos in your course be? No, shorter than that. One minute. <laughs> one minute, one minute's good. I'll go with one minute. Um, no, really, it's just short. So I like that I heard single digit numbers. What number were you going to say before I talked over you? Four minutes? Four minutes is good. Um, single digit numbers are good. Uh, I don't think there is any evidence anywhere that suggests that anyone likes watching a Peter Jackson length Lord of the Rings extended edition epic just to find out the answer to one question or to review one small piece of content. Um, and there is really zero evidence that it's good pedagogy to do tricksy things like put the valuable piece of information somewhere near the very, very end. So if you have a 90 minute video and then there's a quiz question that can only be answered based on something that was said at minute 89, that's more of a trick than making sure they actually watch the whole thing, right? Because we want to make sure they engage with the content. We want to make sure they're learning the content. And this is really just like, oh, did you read that one footnote on page 600? Oh, you didn't? Well, then you can't get 100% on the test. It's kind of, we're sort of losing sight of the goal of providing them this content. Everybody know what this is? How many people in this room have this? Yeah. yeah. No, not that exact model. It can be a similar one. Um, this is increasingly what we're watching video on. So if you are a millennial, of course, that's where the stereotype lives. Like we all live on our phones if we're under 35 or 33 or whatever the, the age is. Um, but really that's not true. This is actually everybody. Um, everybody's using their phone more and more. If they have a smartphone, they are using it to do more and more things because the screens have gotten larger, they're more powerful, they're more capable, they're with us, with us all the time. Uh, if you're a photographer, there's the old adage that the best camera is the one you have with you. Well, the best computer is the one you have with you. So if you need to watch a video and you have your laptop at home, but your phone's in your pocket, which one are you going to use? You're going to use your phone. And you really, again, do not want to watch a six-hour movie on your phone like this. It's not a great experience. Um, I get, yeah, so if dad is watching the big game and then, you know, that's the only TV in the house, then, yeah, you, you suffer. But... Um, I don't think people reach for their phone when they're going to watch like a feature length film. And if your course content videos are feature film length, then you're going to have students who are skipping them entirely or who are just quickly kind of jumping through them. Um, the other thing is uh, when you have a computer device like this in front of you, a laptop, a phone, a tablet, anything, uh, your course content is competing with literally everything else in the world. Right? I can just as easily get to a video in your course as I can to YouTube or Reddit or Tumblr or Twitter or Facebook or anything else. Right, They are all the same amount of effort away. So asking a student for three minutes of their time, four minutes of their time, nine, ten minutes of their time is a lot more reasonable of an ask than, hey, sit down and watch this 90-minute video. Right, For uh, non-traditional students, a 90-minute ask may not even be reasonable. They might have a family, they might have a job, they might have two jobs. Maybe they really don't have time to sit down for one uninterrupted 90-minute block and watch this giant piece of content. Um, so really, I want you to keep all of your videos to the length that they need to be. Right? So if you find yourself going past the 10-minute mark, uh, it's not that you need to shorten that video down, you can break that up. Now you have two minute or two videos instead of uh, one longer video. So the thing about this, when you're considering duration, is your content is going to become more focused. Uh, if you have one hour worth of video content, you could break that up into six 10 minute videos. You could go really crazy and do like 40, 45 second videos, right? Super short, um, which sounds a little bit absurd, but if you're teaching mathematics, uh, anything in the sciences, if you're trying to show something that's complicated, breaking it down into those compound steps is really, really useful for your students because then when they need to review a specific part, a specific topic, they're not doing this, okay? This is a 10 hour video, right? Um, I'm trying to jump to a certain part here, right? You can see my little cursor, little hand, right? And that's assuming I know where what I'm looking for is. I'm only going to do this like two or three times. And if I don't find the part of your video I was looking for, then I just assume it doesn't exist and I'm done looking forever. Um, and this is assuming you're watching on a desktop where you have a trackpad. If you're on a mobile device, your experience is more like this. 
where it's like I can't even see part of the frame I'm going to. The timestamp is totally covered up. This is not, I'm not, I'm not going to put up with this, right? And neither would any of you. If your students sent you a submission and they were like, oh, find my answer to quiz question number six around the three hour mark in this video, you'd be like, nope, right? And they would have to resubmit that. Um, so what about hosting? So these videos have to live somewhere, right? You make a video, you got your phone, you got your laptop, your tablet, whatever, you contact Brian Less and you make something through the video department. So now you have your video, where's it gonna go? Um, I say hosting because you should not be thinking about, I'm gonna put this video somewhere and let my students download it. I want you thinking entirely about, I'm gonna put this video somewhere and my students are gonna stream it. And this is not for security reasons, okay? DRM, Digital rights management has largely failed in the tech industry. It is incredibly easy to circumvent. This is not about preventing your students from having copies of your videos. If they want copies, they're going to get copies. It is super, super easy to pull something off of a streaming site. The point of this is, if you have an iPhone and you make a video, it's gonna be an MOV, right? If you are a Windows laptop person, you might use Windows Movie Maker, you're gonna get a WMV out. If you're a Linux person, anybody? I didn't think so. Um, you're going to get like an MKV or an, AP, an, uh, an AVI, right? So there's all these different formats. When you upload these to services like YouTube or Vimeo or Canvas, right, it's going to do all of the magic and then no one has to care what format that video is in. If you have a student who contacts you and says, I don't have the right kind of player for this video so I wasn't able to watch it, that's, that means they were downloading it and trying to play it locally, right? That's not what we want. And even though standards have come a long way on this, it is way, way easier for you to just put that video up somewhere and then just let them stream it, right? That means they don't have to download it. It just plays right away. It'll play on this device or this device or any kind of device because the player is handling all of what's called the transcoding. Um, so one place you can put your videos is Canvas, right? I assume, uh, has anybody not used the media recorder in Canvas ever? Few people? Okay. So you can upload videos to Canvas. There's also tools in Canvas to create videos. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, but Canvas is a perfectly fine place to host videos, uh, especially if you're doing a good job of keeping them small. You're never gonna run into size problems or anything there. Um, another good option is YouTube. Uh, it's free, it's really, really fast. Its job is literally to serve videos. So they've like kind of gotten it down pretty pat because that it's, is literally its only function. Um, Another hosting option is YouTube, and if you don't like either of those, there is also YouTube. So really, um, between these two things, and when I say YouTube, I kind of mean like YouTube or Vimeo or any of these other like well-known streaming services, um, but really you should not be asking students to go into the files area, download a video, or sending them a link to your Dropbox or to your Office 365 and say, hey, download this MOV and then open it in QuickTime, right? That's more work for you and for them. So it's like, just, it's a net loss all around. Um, and when you host a video in either of these places, it takes care of all the transcoding. It takes care of locking it down as much as these things are possible, right? So on YouTube and Vimeo, you can make these videos private so they're not just gonna come up in random search results. Uh, but there's two things about hosting videos out that I really wanna make sure I address. So is anybody, and please do be honest, is anybody skittish about putting some of their course content on something like YouTube or, or Vimeo, a service like that? Okay. Um, so there, there's two things to that I want to talk about. Um, one is, like I said, DRM, uh, it really doesn't work. Um, if somebody can see something and hear something, they can make a copy of it in one way or another, right? So right now, all of you could be sitting with your phones pointed at the screen copying my slides. Even though I didn't give you a copy of my slides, you would have a copy of my slides, right? Video is gonna work very much in the same way. I can record my screen. I could use any of a number of different tools to pull that video out. And that's not just from things like YouTube, that's anywhere. If it's being displayed on my machine, there's a really good chance I can get a hold of it. So. Disavow yourself of the idea that there is any such thing as perfect security. Um, and the other thing, the far more relevant part to this, especially from a pedagogy standpoint, I think is um, you as educators, we, I, us, all of us, the royal we, um, we are not our content. That is not the value that we bring to the classroom. Um, if one of my students takes my video and my PowerPoint slides and all of the sections of the book that I told them to read and they gather all that up, um, they should not have a perfect reproduction of my course, right? No matter how many videos they have of me talking, how many times they have me up at the board showing 
if that is enough to completely replace me as an educator, they should probably replace me as an educator, right? And I think that's kind of a bitter pill, right? Um, but that's not really what we bring to the table. We are not the things we know. The internet knows all the things we know and way, way more. What we are is our expertise. Uh, we're the feedback we provide students, right? The feedback loop, not just one time, but that ongoing conversation across the semester, maybe even across their entire educational experience here at CU Denver and Anschutz. Um, and our, uh, really our guidance kind of as educators. So uh, once you kind of separate yourself from the idea that if a student gets a hold of that recording, they'll like, right, this is, we're not tribals with the mirror and they've like captured a piece of your soul, right? Like if they have that, that's okay. You can still provide a lot of good value there. Um, and if not, then, uh, I don't know, Khan Academy. Yeah. <laughs> can you tell us the difference between an unlisted video and a private video on YouTube? So a private video requires it to be explicitly shared, meaning, uh, so like say you're, you know, Professor Smith at gmail.com. If I want to share a video with you, I would have to make my video private and then say, but Professor Smith can see it. And also David Thomas at gmail.com can see it, but nobody else can see it. Even if they have the link, they would have to be logged into one of those two accounts. An unlisted video means that anyone with that URL which nobody's going to guess, by the way, those URLs are incredibly robust. Um, anybody who had the URL could technically see that video. They don't have to be logged in or anything, but it won't appear in search. Uh, it cannot be stumbled upon accidentally. They have to know exactly where they're going. So we should list them as unlisted, unlisted. and put the URL in Canvas. You know, where our Correct. Are. So if you've ever embedded a YouTube video in Canvas with that LTI embed, that's going to search things that are public. One of the smart things Canvas does is if you give it a YouTube URL, it goes, oh, that's a YouTube URL, and it just turns it into an embed. So you can put a video on YouTube and make it unlisted and then just copy-paste the URL, and then it will turn it into the nice, pretty, you know, play in line. Um, if you're really concerned and you just want that little bit of peace of mind, Vimeo does offer password-protected videos, but um, the password is cookie, okay? So I only told her, but now everybody in the room heard me, right? So it's like... Yeah, it's an additional step of security, but it's more like a security blanket than like a vault door. Um, but that's another option. This, this is a small little bit that might interest you. I had a couple of clips that had content from Frontline on PBS as part of my critique. Mm -hmm. And I got notice from YouTube that I had, you know, copyrighted content. And I had to remove the video. Just so you know, I mean, they're looking at those videos and what you have. Yeah. So this is, there's an entire terrifying conversation about, those are called DMCA takedowns, Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Uh, and unfortunately, smart people have figured out how to automate those. So they have little robots running that just check videos by the millions every day, and they make copyright claims that they literally don't have the authority to make. Um, it's kind of a broken system. Um, Vimeo does not participate in that as far as I know. Obviously, anything in Canvas is not going to be subject to that same kind of thing. Um, that is a concern with YouTube. I find with educational content, unless you foolishly put, you know, like a David Bowie song underneath it, right, like the day after he passed, when they're looking for that kind of thing, then you're probably all right. Because it's unlikely that someone's going to say like, oh, that person that isn't me and is talking about their class, I have copyright authority to that. Um, so educational stuff's usually pretty safe. Was there another hand? Yeah, yeah I, pr I probably will need additional presentation on this with somebody, but my, my course is national security, and I always do it about simulation. Mm -hmm. And I had to be extremely careful that people don't think what I'm simulating is really happening. Mm -hmm. And so that is, I've had to do yeah. that, like when we did old school and had the situation manual as a printed, and now the situation manual and everything is, I'm going to have, because the class is now online, and I'm going to have to do it yeah. online. And so the way we typically handle it in the security circle is we screen out, you know, this is an exercise. Right. I mean, I, I just really have to think carefully now about, you know, the possibility that somebody can take my face and say, oh, she's screaming about a nuclear attack. Sure. So I may need some additional... So my... Oh, when you disappear... Well, <laughs> I, that's a joke. Every, yeah. every semester I teach, I say, now look, if, you know, I'm not in class the next day. Yeah. But anyway... <laughs> my, I mean, my, my off-the-cuff not being intimately familiar with your, your right. subject matter is um, a watermark. 
So oh. something across the bottom, like a lower third or in the corner that says, you know, fake, 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 okay. right? You know, simulation, educational material, okay. not real. You know, please don't take all your money out of the bank and stuff it in your mattress, that kind of thing. Um, for, for some of your content, that may be sufficient, okay. right? Um, for other things, like if you have text and images, well, on images, you can also use watermarks, but in text, you can always have like a preamble and a postamble, you know, okay. this is not a real press release, this is not a real press release, that kind okay. of thing. Um, yeah, I just, it falls broadly under the, under the realm of like managing expectations, but if you're worried that someone might come across that or that they might save, you know, that article that you shared and then three years later find that in their desktop and be like, oh my God, the Ruskies are coming, like that kind of thing. Um, yeah, preamble, postamble, watermarks. That'll probably get you through a lot of your cases. I mean, I, I haven't specifically had to handle issues like this, so if you guys have, yeah, please do. With the unlisted women's site, it was open works, and then um, if I'm you make, if I make it also unpublished, it's in the same time. Mine was, this is my when experience you put, this was really when you put it on not, YouTube. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, I also right. make it unpublished right. as soon as yeah, possible. Sure. Yeah. My experience was not with women's health or legitimate. It was actual pornography. And I'm, in, I'm in the school of business, and business people say this is a business. It's a legal business. I want to study this business. <laughs> yeah. And we put it so, in Canvas yeah. and then took it off right away. So with uh, YouTube specifically, and each, you know, Canvas is an educational platform, so anything that's considered educational is, is pretty much fair game. I mean, somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but with YouTube specifically, and I imagine like Vimeo and the others are probably pretty similar, um, there is, they actually make a note specific difference between pornography and between things that constitute educational, scientific, or artistic intent. Um, if you look around, you can actually find videos on YouTube of people having sex because it's artistic, right? Um, there are not a lot of them. They tend to toe the line. But if you're, if it's something that's obviously for, you know, uh, reproductive health, um, you know, uh, biology or, or physiology, anatomy class, that kind of thing, um, they're not going to give you any grief about that. There's tons of stuff on YouTube that you could find right now like that. Yeah. Um, and if you are concerned, if, like, say you put a video up and it does get flagged for whatever reason, that might just be a case where it's easier to host it in Canvas instead of on YouTube or Vimeo. So those are good questions. And actually, that came up at a perfect time because I kind of want to now segue into um, more of the discussion and less of the these are the non-negotiables. So the things we just talked about, um, is it short? Does the content benefit from being in the video format? Is it relevant to your course? Is the content in the video focused to as few topics, maybe even just one, as possible? Um, once those boxes are checked uh, and it's been hosted somewhere where your students can get to it reliably, right? They don't have to do wizardry and knock on the door of the special pattern just to get the video every time. Um, then what, right? So now what do you do with these videos that makes them more valuable than just saying, uh, read these 10 chapters, and then in six weeks, we're going to have a midterm, then read these other 10 chapters, and then six weeks later, we're going to have a final, right? Um, we've kind of nailed down that version of a class, and we sort of know that's not the ideal way to teach. So turning that experience into uh, just videos, I don't think really brings a lot to the table. So what can you do uh, to make your videos more relevant in your course? So I have uh, some notes that I took here, and uh, Alex, are you going to be able to take... Okay, so while we're discussing as a group, um, Alex has agreed to take some notes for us, so um, speak clear enough that he can hear you, and then we'll share this out after the presentation. Um, but I have some ideas here. Um, I'm just going to share one of them, and then I want to kind of open it up to anybody who wants to share some ideas. Um, so the first one is, I'm going to start with the simple cheap one, just so nobody else gets to use it, is if you are teaching something complicated that would benefit from motion, and my example here is putting IKEA furniture together, 
Um, I moved not that long ago. We had to buy some new furniture because we moved into a house that had an extra room. And there is this one piece on this media center that uh, said in the instructions goes together like this, just like it slides straight in. That was a damn lie. It actually <laughs> has to come in at an angle and then sit down, right? So a picture saying put these two things together was like never ever under any circumstances going to communicate what I actually needed to do. But if I had just seen someone take the two joints and go at an angle and then set them down, they wouldn't have even had to explicitly say to do it that way. It would have been obvious, oh, look, I'm doing it wrong, right? Um, so, you know, I, my Florgan and the Nurgan weren't going together, right? So that's, uh, that's something that I think is, is really obviously how that would benefit, right? Teaching someone how to juggle, you know, a static picture, right? That doesn't communicate a lot. It's like, well, at one point balls are in the air and then sometimes they're in your hands like that. That's not really useful, but a video, maybe even like a slow-mo video, that would be, even without any additional instructions, more useful than just having pictures and certainly more useful than just having text, right? So there, I've gotten the like super basic obvious one out of the way. So who has some ideas about ways now that you've got your video, your videos in your course, it's short, it's focused, your students are watching it, then what? Share ideas. Then what with that video? So now you have this video in your course, how is that a benefit to your student? What are they gonna do after they've watched this video? Or what is the benefit of them watching it directly instead of reading about it? Do we need another example? Do I have to prime the pump? Well, I've used videos a lot to do, um, to have students do feedback. So they have to watch something and then pick out what went well, what didn't go well, things like that. I've had students actually have to make videos of themselves doing certain activities, and then they give each other feedback. Okay. So you're, uh, instead of having them do like a live performance in a room, they're recording, what do you teach? Not nursing. Nurse. Okay, so they're they're recording their uh, would you, not performance they do, operation. They do like interviews with patients. Okay, and then that way, instead of them just describing it like I interviewed the patient, you can actually observe it as if they were there, right? right? Um, and do you feel like that's been beneficial than them just say journaling about their experience? Very. Yeah. And how it sounds like you're doing peer feedback. Um, yeah, peer feedback, and then we do feedback too. Okay. So we use uh, something in Canvas. Um, new program where you can actually have them comment on points of the video mm -hmm. um, to each other and then they have to each watch them and then write a reflection afterwards like very successful. Okay, so there, to me, that's awesome, by the way, thank you. Um, that sounds like you actually have done, you've combined two good ideas, which is one, you're having your students create videos, right? So this is something um, that I, I kind of hinted at like a little bit is uh, these video creation tools are super easy. There's a lot of stuff that's baked right into Canvas and the, and the Canvas app and on the, the website. Um, all this stuff's available to students too. So it's not just you providing content, you can also request video stuff back from them as their submission, which is one thing you're doing. And then uh, sharing those videos with their peers instead of just you know privately between them and, and you, the instructor, um, how, do your, how do they feel about that? Do they like being able to see those, those live performances? Yeah, it's been, it's been really successful all around. Yeah, um, so to me the big benefit of that is uh, if I'm a student, so say we have a room like this, and I'm the, uh, I'm the instructor, you guys are my students, it would be really boring for all of you if I said, okay, you now interview the patient, now you interview the patient, now you interview the patient, right? Because after like the second one, we've probably all tuned out, right? But if I have a bunch of videos for my peers, I can watch a couple now, I can leave my feedback and comments, and then later I can watch a few more, right? I might actually be only required to say watch two or three, but I might end up watching half a dozen or all of them because I don't have to sit in a room for three hours and just watch everybody do the same thing over and over, right? So to me, that's a huge benefit of that, uh, taking a live performance and sort of distributing it across time. Yeah. Well, I was just sitting here thinking, in my subject area, a terrorist attack doesn't take very long. And so... Um, you have a sad use, subject area. Yeah, the way I use <laughs> this video is that... Um, like, for example, I did use a segment from the movie Syriana, the last mm -hmm. scene where the two terrorists are on the speedboat heading toward the oil tanker. And that's all that you see. They've got the bomb on board. That's all that you see is just, you know, there's, and it, it's not even 30 seconds. But the implications of what happens after the attack is what, so all I showed was that, just boom. 
and then my students had to figure out a course. Well, the, the um, <laughs> and then my students had to figure out not only was there as the immediate, you know, tragedy and aftermath of the of the attack, but then all of you know, it's like concentric waves. All the things that happen after that that they have to do the problem solving about it. Mm -hmm. So that's how I've used video, is that all they need is that one moment, but they then have to do the thinking about all of the, not just individual victims, but institutional and political and policy outcomes of that one moment. So that's how I've, how I've used it. Yeah, so to me that sounds like uh, it's more powerful for them to see something happening and then predict and describe what would happen next, instead of saying... Uh, here's a short story about a terrorist attack, then describe it, right? They can see the people involved, the tools they're using, the methods, right? It would probably be pages and pages of description to get into every detail that you can get in just that 30 seconds. A picture's worth a thousand words, especially here. And, and I think there's an emotional connection that, I mean, I don't want it to go too far, but, they, but somehow that impact spurs them on to really start thinking about what, what would really happen, yeah. you know, after. I, I use videos to kind of in, to, to motivate why we're going to study things, and it takes students to places that they can't go. Because, if, you know, we'll go look at a factory in Georgia. We'll go look at it, and except for the compare and contrast cores and the Budweiser facility, we can't go do those things that they love that. They love that option. <laughs> but, but, you know, and, and so it, it allows you to move beyond the classroom to take students elsewhere. And I don't think I really use them to, you know, you have to learn about the textile plant in Georgia, but then you say, these are the managerial problems that a, a facility like this faces, and so we're going to learn these things so we can deal with those. And so it's kind of more motivation rather than the, the video itself teaching. Yeah. Well, so, so something I feel like you get there, um, I didn't talk about virtual reality, but uh, has everybody heard of Google Cardboard by any chance? Um, so there's a, it's basically a little cardboard box and you slide your phone into it and it holds your phone like this far away from your face and it splits the screen in half and then what you get out of that is like a simulated kind of virtual reality experience. Um, that's like $20, right? Everybody already has a smartphone and that thing costs like 20 bucks. Um, there's of course more expensive headsets and stuff coming down the line. But um, to your point about a large facility like that, uh, there are things I think as a student you would get um, if I'm, I'm seeing a manager talk about the course facility and there's a problem on the line, well, I'm up in my office. It's not like in text, it would say there was a problem on the line. It's more like I heard a crash in the distance. Now I got to run down two flights of stairs. I got to put on my my hard hat. I got to go out onto the floor. Right? It's not like the problem happened right here where I can get to it. It might be on the other side of the factory. And seeing in a video like, oh, this is a gigantic room. Oh, all these people are very spread apart. They're not all in a tiny twenty by twenty space. Um, that's something that you probably wouldn't take the time to describe in text. But in a video, you just sort of. Uh, get to absorb that sort of for free without necessarily focusing on it. Um, and I think that's something that uh, those little like VR kind of gadgets are even going to add in more. You know, if I'm in a giant facility and I choose to look up, I might notice that the ceiling is 200 feet high, whereas in text, I might not even think about how large the, the facility is, right? Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of, uh, I guess, kind of ambient knowledge that you can soak up that wouldn't be worth necessarily describing in text and that even kind of gets lost in pictures because you just have a static view right whereas video is going to be moving looking around up and down are you watching the, the 757 being <coughs> built on an assembly line is just amazing because you would never think that something like that travels on an assembly line and no i didn't <laughs> yeah, it's a it's an impressive video is that do we have one of those here because i swear i see the the big Tractor trailers with a wing going all the time. Windmills, are, they, are they the windmill blades? Okay, it's hard. It's just a big white. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what you said has prompted something that's a concern for me, though, which is that if in doing my simulations, there are some things for security reasons that I can't give you, and I have to describe in text. So I did a simulation of an attack on the jury room at the Cisneros um, courthouse, 
and I can't go in with a video camera and say, well, look at the, you know, look at the vastness of the jury room and think about, you know, I have, I, they wouldn't let, ever let me do that. So yeah. I have, so some things I have to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's right. That's just a limitation of yeah. the world. Yeah. Um, uh, if you are, uh, doing, say you're like a physics professor, your videos may always be graphical representations because we don't have a good way to show a literal atom smashing into another literal atom, right? Um, so that's kind of an extreme case due to size constraints, but your situation I don't think is that different, right? You just literally can't go in there. Right. Um, if you are uh, using footage from, say, like the, the September 11th attacks, you can't go back in time and take footage from a different angle. You only have the footage that's available, right? Um, so I, it, it sounds kind of cheesy to say it, but uh, uh, yes, the constraints of reality still apply. So um, th there will be times where you either don't have the material available or you don't have better material available, and that could potentially influence whether or not you use a video at all. Um, maybe you don't want three seconds of video and then 20 pages of text. Maybe you just say, you know what, I'm just not going to have that three seconds of video because I can't go into the room. I'm just going to stick to text and photographs. Right, so that could influence your your media decision. Yeah. I have kind of a question. You talked about millennials earlier, and something that's really popular now is Vine. And I saw something um, where people were using messages, a message across, and then do you really think that they do you think that could be something that's going to be part of the school or is it going to be part of school in the future? Um. Yeah. I mean, it's. It would the use cases would definitely get increasingly specific because you have such a constrained media. Um, you could make a six second video on another platform and just tell your students or, or restrict yourself to a super short, right? And uh, there's a whole talk we could have about how constraints influence creativity because you don't just have a completely blank page. You kind of have an idea what the boundaries are. Um, but yeah, I mean, why not? Security, six seconds, can, six seconds is a long time in a security situation. So yeah. that's actually, that's, that could be useful. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I could imagine something in your case that's like uh, this, we only have six seconds of video because that's when the bomb went off and, right. and the phone got destroyed, right? So here's the six seconds of the FaceTime recording before their phone was destroyed, exactly. right? So, yeah, I mean, once you start to place... Even if they're arbitrary constraints, once you start to place those constraints, it might give you new ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Snapchat, any, any of those. Yeah, I mean, a lot very of similar. A lot of security information they can retrieve, even though Snapchat is supposed to technically disappear. Yes, it's ephemeral. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, Dr. Pasco, what did we do about a year ago with video? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, that was a pretty neat application of using Google Glass. So I heard CU Online had a pair, and I was thinking that there might be some use to giving a first-person point of view for doing dissection of a cadaver. So I asked David to come on down with the glass and got the approval of the same anatomical board, of course, and no one's really seen it anyway. It was kind of an in-house experiment. And put the glass on and piloted it, and there's a couple of technical tweaks how you fit the lens to your head, and then, um, but yeah, the audio, the video quality, it all looked really nice, so, to, to be further developed, I guess. Yeah. yeah, and this is something that even just maybe five years ago would have been next to impossible, because even a small camera might be this big, right, and if he's doing a delicate medical procedure, and I'm over his shoulder like this, right, trying to capture it as if it was from his point of view, that would be very awkward for him. Um, but if the camera is literally on your face, and Google Glass is just one example, there's lots of sport cameras now like GoPros and uh, Sony makes one that are, are very, very small. They fit right near the side of your head. They have decent microphones. So if you are doing something like a medical procedure or if you wanted to show like a first person experience, you have someone touring a facility, right? You want to see literally what does this person see as they go about their job. Um, it's easy relatively. It's much easier now to capture that kind of experience. Um, and then I think that'll even kind of segue a little bit into this VR experience where uh, you go to a facility and you record it from your point of view. And then I, as the student, can kind of strap that thing on and be like, oh, I just, this is me walking around the facility, except I didn't have to go. And I can do it at 2 a.m. in my pajamas on my couch.
Um, there was one other thing I wanted to make sure I mentioned from my list um, that was you you kind of touched on, but uh, a lot of people um, in my my now day job <laughs> ask me about blogging. Like, well, I want students to reflect, especially as you get up into higher levels. You know, right, four thousand, five thousand, six thousand, seven thousand level courses. Um, there's lots and lots of reflection, right? We're always asking students like. What did you think of the reading? What did you think about the, the medical procedure we did this week? What did you think about the facility we toured? And it's an assignment, but there isn't really a right or wrong answer, right? We're not assessing their ability to have felt correctly about it. We just want them to reflect on the material and engage with the material in additional time. Um, and what I've been pushing people toward, if they're open to it, uh, particularly because it is really easy in Canvas, is uh, turn those into video journals. Let them speak extemporaneously for two, three minutes, right? Just talking head right into their webcam or right into their phone, right? Instead of like a, a long, rambling, highly manicured blog post where they're very concerned about their word choice, if they're speaking more freely, you're going to get a little bit more, I think, of a genuine uh, reaction out of them. And then there's things you're going to be able to read, like all those nonverbals, you know, were they happy while they were talking about the, the facility they toured? You know, were they fighting back tears while they were talking about the, 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 the simulated terrorist attack. And, you know, that kind of stuff just does not come across uh, in text, or at least not very well. Most people are not uh, good enough writers that they're going to think to include that kind of detail, or even if they do think it, they might think it's not relevant. But it's really difficult to keep that stuff off video. That's going to come across whether they want it to or not. Um, other ideas? I think we have... Well, are you, on yeah. security about those blogs, though, again, how if someone is sharing something fairly personal, yeah, so, I mean, just broadly speaking, if they're sharing very personal feelings or if it's a, a touchy subject matter like women's health or if you uh, teach, like, a religion class or something where um, you know tempers and emotions might be running high or it's a very sensitive subject, um, you might lean toward more private just between you and the student. Um, I'm always a big fan of starting open where everybody can see everything and then locking down as necessary instead of starting locked and then opening up as necessary. Um, but yeah, there's always going to be those edge cases where it's like, I'm not going to ask my student to talk about their tragic personal life event in view of everybody else in the class. Um, and it, that's going to be a, a personal thing. Like I, me, literally me, I might do that. I might say at the beginning of my class, we are going to be talking about personal things. Be prepared to share some things with your, your classmates if it was relevant to the course, right? And I'm not going to, in the middle of my English class, be like, how'd you feel when your dog died when you were 10 years old? Like, ha, right? Like, that would just be weird. But um, if they're going into, like, a politics or religion or a, a health sciences class or, you know, a national security class, uh, hopefully somewhere in the syllabus it says something like, this is going to be heavy, right? This is heavy, Doc, right? So they know a little bit about what they're getting into. And then um, when it's appropriate, you can always dial that stuff down to where it's like, okay, uh, this video journal is just between me and the student. They don't have to share this with their peers. You can give them the option, too. You might be surprised. Some students, um, old, young, tech-savvy, not tech-savvy, they might just be like, yeah, it's fine. I've told the story about the time my dog died a thousand times. I don't care if I have to tell it again, right? And they, they might be open about it. Yeah, that's tricky. I would say, when possible, uh, lean toward visuals, um, because if you don't provide something to look at, they're going to find something to look at, right? Um, there's a very interesting bit of research into uh, doodling actually helps you focus on audio when you don't have anything to look at. Um, so now everyone, go back to your departments, and when you're in meetings, doodle. And when somebody calls you out on it, be like, no, I'm listening. You weren't paying attention. I'm doodling so that I can listen, right? Mm -hmm. um, but chances are your students are not going to doodle every time there's just an audio clip. Um, so providing some kind of useful visual, um, never, ever, 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 ever under any circumstances have a verbatim text of what you're saying. That actually uh, engages two opposite parts of your brain that cannot work at the same time, and then they remember nothing, <laughs> or very, very little. Uh, so that's not a good visual, but... Um, I mean, like, at the beginning, I had a picture of a raptor, like, in deep thought, right? It's just, it's something to look at while I'm talking. Um, it's something to focus on. Uh, I tend, my slides tend to be really simple, um, and that's fine. 
super simple slides, photographs, relevant imagery, charts, graphs, that kind of thing is awesome. Really easy to set up and then you could talk over it. Um, unless I had a specific reason not to include any visuals, I would probably shy away from just audio. But there are times, right? Um, if it's a music class, you might not want them looking at anything. You might say, close your eyes, just listen to this, put on headphones. Yeah. So there's cases. Other thoughts? All right, I think we just hit time, so that was pretty good. Um, thank you guys all very much. Alex, can I count on you to clean those up and send those notes out to anybody on the participant list? Oh, sure. Thank you. Um, so if he doesn't do that, that's the guy to yell at. Um, <laughs> but thank you all very much for those ideas. That was really tremendous. I hope everybody picked something up from your peers here. It was good. I know I learned some things.